Hello and welcome to Black Pro Gen Live. We are coming to you this week, week five of our Roots and Chill Challenge, talking about probates and successions. But before we get deep into the conversation about dead folks and their estates and the money involved, we want to make sure we welcome all of our panelists who have joined us for today's episode. All right, everybody, how are you? Let's all come off mute. Let's do our check-in. What's going on, Ellen? Doing fine out here in Florida, waiting for some more rain. Oh yeah, we actually got a torrential downpour last week. I think me and Angela talked about this. My poor tomato plants did not survive that weather. <laughs> so I had to reseed yesterday. Angela, what's going on with you there, Marilyn? Hey, uh, everything's okay. Cloudy still in the 50s. We can't seem to break uh, uh, the 60s for any length of time, but I'm waiting for at least maybe another 10 degrees before I can take all of my seedlings that I have down here next to me. Uh, outside for the remainder of the growing season since we're just at the beginning. But all is well, staying inside. Hope everyone else is also being safe wherever you may be. Exactly. Make sure you stay safe. Keep those masks on. Our other Marylander who's here today, James Morgan, how are you? Well, I'm Black. But this month, I'm Blackity Black Black. <laughs> That's what my shirt says. I'm sticking to it. All right. Down there in Virginia, Reese, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Just hanging in there, trying to stay sane, work on some much needed projects that, you know, I've been meaning to complete for a while that I'm, you know, getting a chance to do and just, I'm just here. So hello, everybody. I hope <laughs> everybody else is staying sane and, you know, as we look as best as we possibly can during this time span, yeah. right? Because there's a lot going on. A lot of a lot of school districts are shutting down entirely for the whole school year. I know that happened here. So if it's happening in Tennessee, it's happening everywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. True. What's going on there in Fort Knox? Just chilling. You know, it's it's cold, but we're just hanging out and just trying to do some research. Look at my matches. <laughs> So yeah, we, we got some new um, functionality. Um, we could talk about that for a second. Right. Too, cause, yeah, because it's been fun. <laughs> Me and True have been having fun with this over the last, last day or so. And we don't yes. know if the rest of you have noticed this, but let me get my notes ready. There was a, uh, was on a call, um, I think it was Wednesday with Ancestry. There's some new things coming down the pike. Um, first off, if you use folders in your messages, right? This is something that was completely foreign to Angela until we started talking about it. And she was like, what do you mean folders? Well, if you're one of the oldie <laughs> but goodie messengers on, <laughs> on Ancestry, you can put your, your messages into folders, right? You could say, you know, for me, I was labeling them by grandparents. So if I contacted a person about this particular grandparent or their family, I would put them in that folder. Well, those folders are going away. Um, they're, they're part of the new messaging system. They were part of the old messaging system and they're not being carried over into the new one. And I think the reason why is because back in the olden days, each time you messaged a person, it wasn't following in the same line, right? Like it would be a separate message. Now, when you contact somebody, you can see the entire history of your messages between you and that person. And so be sure to download your folders when you download them um, onto your computer, they're in a zip folder and then you can unzip them. And then they're actually individual text files with all of your messages in the actual folder structure that you had them in. So be sure to do that before August 31st, before you lose your functionality with that. Also, um, they are um, where, where there's a new functionality, and I think I probably should demo this um, in the uh, in the in the screen so you guys can see it. Um, and I'll be sure to use accounts that I have access to, so we're not getting in trouble showing people's information that you know mind you showing their information, right? We want to be good stewards of our DNA matches. But one of the things that they have now is they're giving you the ability to attach your DNA matches to your family tree, right? So you may administer several accounts um, through your Ancestry DNA account. Um, and you might already have everyone linked to the same tree, but now you can actually attach their DNA results and their profile to your tree. So we'll all, let me show you my screen. Yeah, let's give a moment for a collective. Wow. 
what? Yes, we gonna have a collective what on this one because you're because every because I can see Angela going wait a minute because because the other day we stayed on afterwards and Angela found out about clippings and stuff on newspapers.com and I ruined her entire night and I loved you did. every single <laughs> oh, you really did I loved, I loved every single minute of it she got all of her life her genealogical life that day so we're gonna I'm um, gonna show you guys briefly some of this new functionality that's on Ancestry. All right, so you are looking at my page here, right? So there goes there goes Mama BJ, it's my mama, right? You'll probably notice there's some new icons um, next to these DNA matches, right? This little thing. I see a Morgan. Well, they, yeah, that's my first cousin once removed, right? So you'll see those little those little icons next to people. If there was not a tree connected already, it would be it wouldn't be there. So let me show you um, let me show you how you add this information and what it does. So if we go over to my mom's account, she don't care. She knows what's going on. Oh, you may be related. Notice how the screen has changed, right? It doesn't look the same. It says she might be your mother. Well, she actually is my mom. But what I did is if I come over here, right, notice it's got this little check. If I click this box, I have the ability to connect my mother on my tree to the results right there. OK, if I click view on tree, it'll pop open my tree from my mom's perspective. What this does is this keeps you from having to keep a tree open in another window while you're researching other people. And you can you can add these things to everyone. You notice I've got a slew of people on here because I know all these folks that have tested and I can pop their trees open from right here from their perspective. I didn't have to open up my tree, search for them by name and pull it up. It comes right up. Plus, it'll also do things like if you've got similar surnames, it will identify those if the person is not, if they don't have a tree there. So feel free to check out that functionality. I've loved it. I've loved playing around with it. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> I think True likes it too. Yeah. But look at all the suggestions. Look at this situation. I the first cousin on. once removed, it's got suggestions. Oh, it could be this relationship because this name is in both of your trees. Oh, but wait a minute. It could be the other, another one. It's in both of your trees. Oh, here goes a third. This is in both of your trees, right? It is basically crawling your data so that you, so you can be smarter. It looks so much more useful than before. Very yeah. much more useful and user-friendly. I didn't okay. realize it was new. I used it last night for the first time. And I guess, cause I've just don't keep up like I should. And so I'm just clicking on it and I'm like, oh, this is a cool feature. How did I miss that? Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it was new, but yeah. yeah it I suggested my grandfather's first cousin. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. like, okay. I, I found it last night myself and um, I, I wasn't sure I knew it was. I knew it wasn't something that we had been using for a while, but I, I really think it's really handy. Because I, I like you, I, I administer a number of people's DNA matches and stuff and it, it does help you be a little more organized. So definitely check it out. Great, great. Well, I just had to put that out there because we've been playing around with that, kind of seeing what it does. Um, I think it's actually more accurate when it comes to your through lines. It's, to me, it seems like it is populating the information more accurately because it's based off of your tree. And it's it's just it's just play around with it. Let us know how the functionality goes. Like I said, it, it was great for me. I loved it. Um, there's also a new feature called Story Scout that is coming out um, that is awesome um it really it's made mostly made for um beginners or people who haven't really started the journey of family history research it prompts them to put in the names of their ancestors and then it ties historical events and records that they've already found and it gives them an actual like oh instead of this is a census it actually says what is in each row they were employed they worked this many number of hours per week they were involved in this industry right it's another way to distill the information and bring people in who typically are not interested in family history research so look out for story wow. scout look out for uh this new functionality um that uh <laughs> comes on ancestry dante eubank said at the rate ancestry is going we need to check in daily to see what the changes are jeez <laughs> And it was right before yeah. I went to bed and I ended up staying and up I messed a up a whole hours. Life. I messed up a whole life. I live for that. If anybody has seen me present live, that is the first thing I say is I hope you stay up all night long. 
<laughs> and thinking about something that I said or that I mentioned or that just made something click. And I did it for Angela. I could, I did it for True. I'm going to do it for you. All right. Sounds like I'm doing a sermon. One, one of the things that I love about the DNA uh, feature is that like my mom, she doesn't have any full siblings. All her siblings are half. And so it, it, it makes it really hard sometimes when like DNA stuff comes in because the computer will read it one way and I go, well, no, that's my mom. It's her half first cousin or whatever, but it might read as a nephew or a niece or so I, I really like the fact that you're kind of able to give feedback to the system. Yes, agree. Because here's the thing, right? People complain about through lines all the time. Carmen is like the biggest proponent of through lines. So when this came out, I was like, True was like, see, see, like she you know, I always get on her about that. <laughs> She pulled a CCC on her, but that's the thing. It's only as good as the data that's out there, right? Right? right. Now, if yes. you choose uh -huh. to ignore the data and then tell people that we're going to open a country up when we ain't supposed to open a country up, right? <laughs> right. Right? So just think of this in that, pers that perspective. Rather than ignoring, you just look uh -huh. at what's available and it, if it needs correction, then you can refine it and this is fine-tuning. So like I said, I'm going to be interested to see how how this goes with um as things progress forward uh dante came back and said that uh he said that he thought it was just you know he just zipped past the icon he thought it was just a new family tree symbol this is why you have to be curious because <laughs> you completely missed it but that's all right we get you together here today um all right, so probates and successions can be a goldmine for nearly every research era, whether you're looking for the deceased person's family members or you're trying to verify your ancestors' connection to the deceased through slavery. These records can act as a wrecking ball to brick walls. All right, well, don't, I'm just going over this. This is the thread that was on Twitter. So if you missed it, you can go back. Uh, we'll put the link in, uh, in the chat so you guys can access that because um, we laid out some really good steps for you. Um, in terms of looking at probates and successions. And so uh, we're covering probates and successions as part of episode 110, Court Records for People of Color Genealogy Research. That's gonna be airing live on Tuesday, April 28th. So make sure that you do not miss that. Also, we talked a lot about probates and successions in, on the playlist uh, for finding and tracing your enslaved ancestors. That is mentioned in the thread as well. The challenge for this week was determine what is available online when it comes to the probates slash successions of interest in your ancestral locations. You can do this at home by searching the massive U.S. wills and probates uh, uh, database at Ancestry or by browsing through the family search catalog. Keep in mind that most probate succession work is done manually online. Mm-hmm. Manual. That means you ain't putting the name in, typing it in, results come up. Just don't work that way. Most of the records in Ancestry's collections are not text indexed. They are not. This is the same at Family Search. You'll actually have to browse to get to the records. Sorry, no shortcuts. This can take hours, if not days, weeks to get through these things. Am I lying? No, I'm not. <laughs> All right. So have the ha, uh, how are the microfilm records organized? Got to know that. OK, if you're not clear on how they're arranged, you can miss crucial finds. Familiarize yourself with how they're kept from one location to the next so you don't overlook a thing. Probate slash successions have a multitude of records up to and including wills, inventories, testimony and more. Go through the entire file. Don't just get to the inventory and then back out. Don't do that. Don't do it. Don't do it. Okay. okay. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> For making any judgments, right? You got to go through the whole thing. Because you can't say something's not there if you didn't look throughout the whole thing, right? And there may just be to check a box off. Like, I, I checked it. OK, be creative. If you're researching a slaveholder, you'll need to know the names of their relatives. You'll will, you will likely have to look through more than one person's set of records to have the greatest possibility of finding your ancestors since slavery was familial. Can we say familial, everybody? Familial. Okay. <laughs> so that means that it was based, it was a system based on families. Okay. This is wealth. This is like you passing your house down to your children. Okay. So if you don't know the slaveholders family, you better know that you better know them as well as you know, the people that you're researching as the potential in slave. Okay, you're joining us for the wrap up. Of course, we always have help available to you. So that thread is definitely going to be there after the show is over. And each time we have one of these wrap ups, we do we lead the week off with a thread that basically shows you what to do. So panel, a steam panel wearing black and green and red today. For some reason, we all color coordinated. I don't know how we did that. 
what have you found in terms of probate records this week? Well, I can tell you right now, one thing that I found that I did not know, I was researching um, on my ward side of my family uh, with my cousin Lucretia. Um, she uh, tunes in the Black Pro Gen every once in a while. And for those who don't know who she is, she actually played Janet Jackson in the Bobby Brown, in the Bobby Brown uh, biopic. <laughs> Wait um, a minute, you just went full Black person. <laughs> Yeah, that, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I'm you black every say, month, but this month I'm blacky black black. Wait a minute, look, <laughs> Reese, come off mute, cause child, look. Sh let me tell you, you just went full. You went full. You went full melanin, cause only black folk. You know, she played in the new edition movie, or she yeah. played in the in the Bobby Brown movie. Not she's an actress, and she her first her best well known role was in. <laughs> no, it's the person played in it, like it was mm -hmm. a play on stage play. Okay, yeah. keep going back. Keep and, going back. In the immortal words of Paul Mooney, I'm not Hollywood, I'm neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. But well, what um, did you and Lucretia from the uh, Bobby Brown movie find? What we right. found was, matter of fact, I can show it to you. We found a uh, probate record for Mr. William J. Ward. Uh, we were researching Lucretia's direct ancestor, who would be one of my great great uncles or what have you. Uh, and that uh, probate record, I'm going to share the screen here for you all, uh, actually shows her ancestor, Tom B. Uh, Ward, Tom Boy Ward, uh, and his mother. Uh, can you all see that there? Yeah. All right. So this is the, so this is a, the uh, beginning of the, the, the file from William J. Ward. And the thing that I just, it, it, I want to say I love, but I don't love it, but I appreciate the fact that on probate records in Alabama, a lot of times, they will show right on the front, right on the front of the folder, the names of enslaved wow. individuals. Okay, and if you look right here, where my mouse is hovering over, we see the name of Tom Boy, uh, which was Lucretia's direct ancestor that we were researching. Um, in going through the file, we actually were able to find um, the the will, and we were able to find a um, document. Let me show you this this last one here, uh, where it t it tells us. Uh, what the executors are reporting back to the court as to the disposition of the enslaved individuals. And you'll see that here. One of the things, that he, and I won't read it all to you, to you guys, but one of the things that we found very, very fascinating, mind you, this all is taking place right before the Civil War, is that the estate basically was saying that they did not have enough money to settle all debts. And so the enslaved individuals that were listed on the front of the document, were it was recommended that they be put up for auction to raise the funds necessary to settle debts against the estate of William J. Ward. Now, and mind you, this is right, this is within a year, maybe a year and a half prior to the official launch of the Civil War. So was William J., so now we're, we're trying to keep, we're, we're still going through this uh, information, but the question right now is, was William J. Ward really the last slave owner? Did they get sold? I mean, we know that these individuals still remained in the same area after the war, but what happened in the intervening time. We don't know quite yet, but that's why as Nika said earlier, you gotta go through the entire file. So that's where we're at right now with that. All right, mm. anyone else? I think Angela, were you getting ready to say something about a probate? Uh, uh, no, I was just gonna point out uh, the fact that I had revisited a file I hadn't looked at in a very long time. It was on family search and it was an, I don't have it up on the screen to share, but it was an estate record out of Tennessee, out of Giles County, Tennessee from 1860. The slaveholder died in May of that year. And my ancestor from Southwest Arkansas, Mitchell Bass, he's mentioned there as a slave as were affording uh, additional slaves as well. And I realized, uh, I don't know after probably the thousandth time of looking at that file, they were listing, except when it got to the children, they listed them as a group, but they listed couples. So they listed uh, my second great grandparents, Irvin and Nancy, whom I knew, but they listed two older couples as well and uh, who were in that household. And I realized one of those two older couples is possibly um, a parent to one of my second great grandparents because they were much older. And I looked at it because I never knew who they were and just sort of, okay, I don't know who they are. But then I realized when I was revisiting for the thousandth time, oh my gosh, these are couples in the front. 
and then they're listing who the children belong to or who the children were. And uh, it's good to revisit some of those documents you've always had, because I've had this for several years. But then I looked at the naming, uh, Urban and Nancy, Frank and Phoebe, you know, and I realized, oh my gosh, this might be, a, I don't know which one of those two older couples may have been a parent couple to my folks, but it is good to just revisit what you have. All right, anyone else make any good finds or review some old stuff that you had? True, you had your, you got your stack of papers. Reese, you got your stack of papers. Which, which yeah. one of y'all want to go first with your stacks? Well, I don't know. You I, go ahead, Reese. I'll go first, True. <laughs> um, well, um, I haven't made uh, these discoveries this week, but I have made these discoveries within the last two months before we went on lockdown. And... Um, I actually found information I wasn't looking for. Um, I, you know, I've been doing these tours and um, talking about the communities and the people in these communities. So um, I was researching um, the Wendell Scott, first black race car driver, um, just researching his Motley family because I have a Motley line, just trying to see if they were connected. You know how you do, you sitting around and you like, okay, you know, let me, you know, um, check on this. So I, um, Wendell Scott, um, the slave owner that, uh, the, the person that enslaved his family, um, Hartwell Motley, um, um, his widow, uh, Martha Hooper, she marries a Sexton Smith. Now, where did I hear the Sexton Smith name from? Uh, uh, my ancestor, Gardner Luck, which is the one that I've been looking for, his slave owners forever and a day. Um, excuse me if I'm going around in circles, but I wasn't looking for Gardner Luck. But um, on the 1880 census, Gardner Luck is living next door to Oscar Luck. Um, paper trail, I don't find him in Oscar connected. So um, Oscar, um, he lists his parents on his uh, death certificate. And um, I found his father, which was Thornton Smith. His last name was Oscar, was Luck. But I found his uh, Father, Thorn Smith, listed in the Virginia births and uh, the Virginia births deaths index um, on ancestry, 1853 to 1917. So I find that death record and on there it lists his slave owner, which is Sexton Smith. So I had seen that Sexton Smith before. OK, so um, I know that the Motley's, they ended up um, with with the diary. I had that. that uh, it's important to. Um, the ancestor groups like of your county, like the Danville, Pennsylvania County um, history groups, um, you would be surprised at the people who list the um, just wills and deeds of, you know, their ancestors of the enslavers. Um, so Hartwell Motley, this, uh, this will had been posted everywhere. Um, so I know that the Sexton Smith, they got all the Motley slaves with the diary that came from the deceased. Well, um, with this Sexton Smith, uh, I had a cousin, a cousin named Ann, who told me years ago, just asking her, you know, where did the family come from? And she said, girl, we come off the Patty Smith plantation. And I'm like, she don't know what she's talking about. You know, that doesn't make sense. You know, and you really have to revisit some of these things that your family tell you, even when it doesn't sound right. Because when I researched this Patty Smith, I found out that her father-in-law was Sexton Smith. Okay. Um, I knew from my great-great-grandfather. Now, I just, I said, well, forget the Motleys. This is leading me to the luck some kind of way. Um, so, um, Sexton Smith's uh, will. Um, on this will, it, it had my great-great-great-grandmother, Paulina who was Gardner Luck's wife and um, the children that had been born so, um, so far. I knew Gardner couldn't be too far behind. He had to be in the backyard somewhere. But um, Sexton Smith, his first wife was a Wilson and her father was the, an enslaver named John Wilson. And I knew from my great, great grandfather's death certificate that Paulina, her maiden name was Wilson. So I first checked on John Wilson's will and there was Paulina. He left, Sexton Smith, Paulina in his will as just a gift to my good friend, Sexton Smith. And so Sexton Smith leaves my Paulina to his daughter, to his daughter-in-law, 
Um, no, his daughter, Martha Virginia Smith, by his first wife, leaves them to her, and she marries a man named William Fitzgerald. Okay, now uh, she marries William Fitzgerald, and he dies. And I find out that after he dies, she marries a big lottery man from Richmond named Caddis Bohannon Luck. See, so it's like that's where my luck name comes from. So it comes from her husband, who yes. wasn't even her slave. Come on, yes. Now. Didn't so, uh, just yes. Say, didn't yes. we just say you got to know the slave owner's family like yes. this is yours? You got to know who yes. the women married, you got to know who the men married, you got yes. to know the maiden names, you got to know who they did business with, right? And I'm gonna say this one little, this one little tidbit. Go ahead, go and ahead. This is going this gonna blow your mind right here. Now, I have a research buddy, Lander Anderson. He's in my Oggs chapter. Um, Lander, uh, right when they did the shutdown, it was the last day the courthouse was open. And I said, I'm not going out. I said, but I need that will of William Fitzgerald to see if perhaps he owned my gardener, you know? And so Lander said, well, I'm going to the courthouse. And he went and he called me and he said, look, I know you don't want to come out, but you're going to have to meet me somewhere. And I met him in my office parking lot and he said, okay, are you ready for this? He presented me the will of William Fitzgerald with my Gardner Luck on it. Gardner Luck was his only slave. Wow. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry for going so, all around no, the No, bend. no, that's all right. Because here's the thing. <laughs> but, well, people, did, did, did this fall amazing. in your lap? Did somebody come out with a, wow. on a blank wall like this and say, mm. oh, here, Reese, here's your folks. Didn't you have mm -hmm. to go on a wild goose chase? Did yes. you have to go on a wild goose yes. chase? Yes. Over that's 20 years. years. Over years 20 years. Of, come wow. on now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Because I, yeah. I really want people to get that, that unless you have one of us in your family where we are presenting the information, you are going to have to do the hard work. Yeah. It is going to frustrate you. You are going to feel like you are on a wild goose chase. But as long as you remember that slavery is familial, that mm. it was a system mm. involving mm. money and yeah. people and product. You know, I really wish that folks would start treating slavery, researching slavery like the wire. Mm -hmm. or like any of these other shows that that are crime where you know you're sitting up watching olivia pope and you're wondering well you know what she should have went to the song so you could strategize so well off of olivia pope slash carrie washington but you are not using that same line of thinking with regard to your genealogy and family history research i've definitely done the webay look when i find uh big discoveries you yes, know look I'm talking about. Though. Yes, if you are the wire watcher, I'm sure you've probably used that GIF on on social media somewhere where he's like, "Dang," and he turns to the side. That's WeeBay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. True Ann, True Ann, what you got? Uh, well, I'm gonna wrap it up. So what I did was, you know, the file that we're talking about. That's just for one person in 1856, wow. and that's not over there i'm not going to get into it but That's the whole point right is in 2010 these are the white slave owners the ivies that enslaved my that are part of granddaddy ike's um family you know enslavement wise because of course you know we say ivory now because granddaddy i put the r in there but that's where we started off. but what i ended up doing was in the early days i think this file was from 2010. So of course, I'm always constantly working on it, updating and doing things with it. So what my idea was, I took Barna Ivy, put his parents, his siblings, all his children, um, because of this probate packet has what happened to his minor children, his two grown sons that were in charge. I made a tree for them on ancestry. And I've been tracking this man's life like I tracked my black ivories from when they were in Lenore County, North Carolina, to when he was in Barber County, Alabama, Russell. Then they went back to Georgia, came back in, of course, with Barbara and Bullock and Pike. And that's where my black ivories come in at. So I have been growing this tree as bait, attaching documents, because of course their trees are all nice and pretty, but yet they don't have this on there. Um, 
so that's can, what I've can been we doing. can we say that one more time because see that's 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 <laughs> something else i think people people are, are, are we have nice allies in the genealogy community we sure do mm -hmm. but a lot of them this is an aspect of their family history that they don't they don't consider a part of the exhaustive search Right, right, but, and, and that, and about. let me let me just go on. Go ahead. Angela, Angela, come on now, come <laughs> off mute because I know you got something to say about this. Right, this is a big reason why I I understand certification, but I don't because I've seen how people. I love how True just went back and checked the calendar because she because she had to just <laughs> <laughs> she rolled back. But I'm gonna say it. I understand certification, and in some ways, yes, there is a need for that. But the level at which certification has been bestowed upon people when they have not truly exhaustively searched and connected their ancestors to aspects of our history mm -hmm. that are now considered to be frowned upon or negative, how, how do we truly consider that to be an exhaustive search if you're, not, if you're willingly withholding that information, if you are willingly not putting that forth? I don't give a rat's patootie what initials you have behind your name. Are you being truthful? about the total story of what's going on. And so if I have to act as a means to shine a light on your the horrible stuff, you know, that went on, I'm gonna do that because my, exactly, that's why she Hell has it. that file, right? <laughs> but, but I mean, but that's an aspect of certification Man. in the genealogy world that I don't think anybody pays attention to. The whole notion of, of what is considered exhaustive because <laughs> slavery has never really been exhaustive. Mm -hmm. You know, that was always my gripe was you can't like we can't find our family without yours because you're not telling the mm -hmm. story. And I had to actually could not get to Alabama and had to order these through the Alabama Department of Archives and History and check off those marks and pay online that twenty five dollars. And that's what I just kept on doing until I could get down there and get it myself. But I was so eager that I even started following the two overseers that he had on the property. But I've always said that, that we have to take a step back and look at what does exhaustive research mean? Because mm -hmm. when we've been doing this for years and years and years, I don't know how you could say your research is exhaustive if you have not mentioned those enslaved or your the other people in the community around right. there. They're so up into this fan work. Well, where was my, my people at in that fan? Mm -hmm. Where was Tommy Boy in that family? Right. If so, we're gonna, we gonna pull an actual name, especially when his name is on the front of the folder, you pull the, the will the out of. Come, come on, on now, James. So you willfully that. come on. Yes, you and I've seen that in you Alabama. You willfully went around the block. You went around right. the block when you could have walked a straight line to the corner. Come on now, mm -hmm. Angela. So, come on, come on. I, I need the elder to speak. Right oh now. Lord. Go ahead, go ahead, Miss Angela. Well, I think it's interesting, the, just from so many different angles. Um, we didn't hear some terms such as exhaustive search, such as certain um, standards of genealogical proof, until suddenly. A different group of people started entering the genealogical Black community. Black people. Okay. <laughs> uh, suddenly, people who began to look at enslaved individuals began Black saying, hey, people. these are people, number one, they're my people, and I want to find them. Oh, well, you must have some standards to do this. Wait a minute. When all those different types of other little groups, some of which were putting out some very poor genealogical work, were doing that. Standards were never emphasized. Suddenly, uh, suddenly, um, there was the the, the proof. Uh, one suddenly had to rely. What was the term that's used in the legal world in terms of of uh, putting out a certain degree of of proof, preponderance of evidence, mm -hmm. and uh, but. At the same time, it was assumed that once a certain group of people entered the genealogical community, well, you all really have no standards and they don't know how you're doing. Uh, really, but you didn't say that and to others who were also new and just beginning. But apart from all that, apart from all that, um, it's difficult to research a people and be exhaustive when the people you're looking for are not even mentioned. Example, many of you know I research Oklahoma. Until 1990. Three, 
after I published my first book on Black Indian genealogy research and uh, uh, looking at the five civilized tribes and the freedmen, of which there are more than 14,000 people. 14,000 people, not 1,400 people, not something that's anecdotal, but thousands upon thousands scattered among five tribes. Not, that's just from one collection reflecting that population. Okay. But at the same time, suddenly someone else writes a book on, oh, your ancestors among the five civilized tribes. Why didn't you write that before? You didn't write that five years before I started doing my research. But suddenly, okay, it's okay to mention them. But it's okay to mention them just that, yeah, there are a few records. But again, there are people who are researching their records who have, oh, who are just beginning to hear about the Dawes Rolls. Thankfully, thank you, Ancestry. You scan them in color, the Dawes cards. Valkyria's had um, many of the records. So has Family Search has had several of the records, the allotment records. But there's not been a comprehensive look at the freedmen per se, because people sort of, well, those were just the slaves, just the slaves. Come on now. Just the slaves. Come on uh, now. Many people but, who live in but Oklahoma. Your, but your larger points brings back to what we're talking about. Is yes. That's the reason why you went around, you went around the corner, you went around the block when you could have just walked straight to the corner. Well, there was a series of books published in the 1990s called Cherokee by Blood. Good, good records. They were abstracts of freedmen. I mean, freedmen. They were abstracts of Cherokee interviews. Okay, well, where were the Cherokee Friedman series? There was no series. And the inference being that, well, if you're Cherokee, you were certainly not Black or didn't have any association with those folks who were just slaves. I did. Uh, okay. Uh, and this, this is very serious, though, because it's still not mentioned. If slavery is not taught as having occurred and on the soil that became Oklahoma, then of course the concept of freedmen from Oklahoma is really out there and out of space on Pluto or wherever. Um, it's unknown and untaught. Untaught. You can't even say it's ignored. You have now over a hundred and what ten or plus years of statehood where slavery was never taught. And if slavery was never taught, well then of course the enslaved were never mentioned. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you're fighting in a community. You're struggling and fighting to just tell this narrative when the limitations are there. Now there's another set of limitations that come from outside the genealogical community that comes from the community of scholars. There are many scholars who, who are writing books and, and we appreciate them and we read those footnotes all the time. Uh -huh. Yet, uh -huh. do, do those scholars yeah. interact with those in the community? Mm, I, I monitor, <laughs> I monitor a group on Facebook where we are looking at these records. There are scholars in those groups. There's a gentleman that I've known over 20 years and who teaches Native American studies, but yet we can't get that input and interaction from the academic community. So many of us are having to, sometimes, sometimes we stumble upon records. If you follow the footnotes, you find another set of, of records. Yet that, that conversation, that dialogue is limited. You have others who are gonna hang up their shingle. I'm gonna become a specialist in researching um these wonderful black folks and but yet will they interact with no. others who are researching no nope. historical tourists shoot Come on. what are you talking about that's and, that's and more like serious. that's what well, mm -hmm. i'm liking it more to the stock market okay come on with that i want to hear that in terms of in terms of buying and tr buying and selling our history and trading it like it's a commodity yes yeah right I, because you can you can no longer commodify my body you're going to commodify my history Mm -hmm. because That's it benefits you it makes you stand out it makes you look like you're unique right so right. you know don't be a stock market trader of black history which means that if you fund a project that involves people and involves their ancestors you need to give them access to it technically mm -hmm. you don't own it yes yep. i know you paid for it but it's not your history mm -hmm. but when you treat it like a commodity that's what you do but at the same time, there, maybe there needs to be some sort of platform or vehicle through which we can also talk to those, rec I don't know if you call them record keepers or record holders. I mean, I certainly appreciate the things that Family Search has done. I appreciate the things that Ancestry has done, Fall Free has done. However, we know it is critical for African-American researchers to know who the slaveholder was. At the same time, 
the Freedman records that have been digitized, they'll have the name of the person and the card number. And the slaveholder is listed on the card, but they were never indexed. Ancestry, I love what you did, but you did not index slaveholders, and it's right on the front of the card. Well, the hell, names, even the even the, the Oklahoma Historical Society didn't do that, and they're the the first set of people that got those records right outside of the National Archives. So, the well, this the is National a, Archives is the owner of it. Well, that's what I'm are. saying, but it's yeah. a, but it's a larger issue of let's protect the people who enacted the atrocities. Well, the record keepers, right? Like it's it's let's protect the gatekeepers versus let's protect the people who deserve to find the information out. Ellen, go ahead. Just so I just want to mention that Florida has like I think 26 reels that have never been digitized. And what are those reels? Friedman records. Are you serious? Yeah, I went looking and and I at one point I was trying I was going like of course this people they're going to show up here and then when you go see what's been transcribed it's like four cases or something and then you find out there's all this additional material that hasn't wow. been wow you know that hasn't we been also we also need advocates in these communities where our local archives are to go into these historical societies and to the courthouses and say, okay, can I have access to look through these things? Because a lot of these things are placeholders, holding up old windows. Um, I know in the case of the Caswell County Courthouse, some records are kept at the Richmond Miles Museum which uh, the Caswell County Historical Association runs. And um, just years ago, just looking to see what they had, uh, they had an old marriage register from 1867 that was just dusty, that was just thrown in the back room, that was just holding up an old window. And um, I've looked for cohabitation records and, you know, it always... Any um, where you go online, you know, when you go to look, they say, oh, we only have one cohabitation record that was saved. But you have this whole marriage register from 1867, you know, which lists well, last and slave owner and all well, of this, you know. I, I, I can't say that we just need to go out and hang ancestry out to dry because. I mean, let's let's be honest. Family search oh, is, the, is the source of a lot of mm -hmm. the records that are online because they they made the investment to microfilm and yeah. digitize these things. And as as much as I know for them, it's a matter of you know salvation and not. I also need them to realize and recognize that by going into these environments and selectively choosing what they decide to microfilm or digitize. Mm, what message are you sending to your potential membership when you when you're when you're going around the block rather than directly to the corner? Go ahead, Ellen. There's just that larger problem of of underfunding of archives across the board, and depending on what state you're in, how much is actually a portion to that can be just so minuscule, and it really hampers so many people's projects because the state doesn't have the money. So, like, I mean, I'd love to see more in some of these southern states, but I'm not sure at what you know where the pressure points that we can apply to try to get to try to get people to recognize no this is valuable we need to have the money put into this not well just, i mean you know. i think it's to me i liken it to what we're seeing right now andrew yang was was arguing for universal basic income three four five six months ago and people said it wasn't possible but last i checked two days ago was april 15th and even people who had not filed for taxes got direct deposits into their accounts of $1,200 per adult. Mm -hmm. So um, there was a, a medium post that I shared probably about a week or so ago where the, the person opined, don't forget what you're seeing right now because there's going to be a marketing uh, effort made to make you think that you what you saw didn't happen, that you didn't see everyone in the country get $1,200 per adult and $500 per child, that you didn't see uh, all this money and resources coming out that people, people, you know, were given a moratorium on their rent and their mortgage for, they couldn't be evicted for four months. There's going to be a machine that's going to make you think that, that, that did not happen when we actually saw it with our own eyes. And to remember that when you go and you vote and you, and you move into spaces, you know, where people may be leading you politically saying these things can't happen when you just saw it happen. Right. So I just have to put that out there in terms of funding and other things, because I don't want us to be short-sighted and think, well, they say they don't have the money. They probably do. Where is it going? If they can cut money from schools and other things to finance, right? If, if Wisconsin can shut down 
you know, 175 voting polling locations, but keep five open so that people can risk their lives to vote. And where's the where's the money going from from those 175 polling places, right? That and we have a right as citizens to to ask those questions because it's our money, it's our tax money, it's what we're what we're making. Um, it's interesting in this chat room. Um, Sharon Bruno said that she was a part of indexing the Freedmen's Bureau records on on um, Family Search and said that they were trained not to include the extra names. That was part of the training, mm -hmm. and that they, they they were told they were not important. But she says she did it anyway. Thank you. Good for her. Good, just good for just her. have to put that out there. Um, so before we go, of course, you know, we, we started out talking about probates and successions, but this wraps in well, because we were talking about commodification of people, right? A lot of the people who are watching this show are trying to find their ancestors while they were enslaved and they would be listed as property on an inventory or estate. And that was the one way that we were commodified, right? Now it's different right? <laughs> we talked about our history being commodified, right? But here's the other thing that I want to kind of remind people of. Um, here is your stay up all night resource. Um, if you guys have not found it, um, this is in Reese's Stomping Grounds. If you don't know about the Library of Virginia and their Chancery Records Index, I need you to get some act right. This is an amazing resource. Um, and it's, it mirrors somewhat what James showed earlier, where you do the search on the site and um, they put the names of the slaves on the outside of the folders. And this is available. It's over 272,000, more than a quarter million chancery court records for the state of Virginia are on this site and they're available for free. It's nearly 11 million image, images here. And this is the Library of Virginia. Um, and, uh, you know, you can literally just search Chancery Records Index Library of Virginia and this will pop up. And there's an index you can search based off of the county, the plaintiff, defendant, or just a surname. And you can put in years, uh, uh, you know, years of cases, right? And, and don't think that it just has to be a probate, right? Probate and secession, that word means something different in every location, right? Let me give you an example. Probate packets are available on Family Search. What you're looking at, is a page inside of a 200 page probate packet for a slaveholder. What does that look like, you all? Looks like a grave to me, like a, like a monument. Like a like it looks a like a monument. Yeah. yeah, it looks like a monument, right? Well, if you flip the page, because you see they, they pop that little piece of paper down, it's, this is the receipt for the slaveholder's headstone. Mm. From 1853, they paid $350 for this monument, and that was a rendering of the grave marker. It even includes what they wanted chiseled into the limestone. Wow. So, but here's another thing. Remember, this is 200 pages. Two pages before this is the inventory of enslaved people. So this was buried directly in this same file. Okay? Most of the time they put them towards the back. Exactly. Yeah. This was smack dab in the middle. Okay. This is another example here. Usually when you see estate inventories, you'll find people in family groups, but you'll notice that it's mostly male names on this one. There are no family groupings, right? If you flip another couple pages, we go from, usually they have all the slaves bun bundled together, right? On this one, they sort of do, but they move from one list of slaves back to rocking chairs and maps, and then they go back to slaves down here at the bottom. Property. Scan the entire inventory. Do not stop at just where they say Negroes, because you see here, they didn't even th look, look at this. Look at this small notation that says Negroes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm to pivot back. Okay. Mm -hmm. So these are yeah. just a couple of the things that you can find in estate files. All right. I'm going to share another one and you're probably going to be shocked by this. You know, that estate records exist for people who are not dead yet. Petition to sell real estate. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah. Okay. That. This is a record from the County court, Craig County, Oklahoma, in the matter of the estate of Clarence Rogers, you're thinking, oh, but Clarence is dead. Actually, Clarence is not dead. <laughs> She's a minor child of Clara B. Rogers, who was her mother and her guardian. 
And this, this, it says the Guardian further shows the court that her said ward, Clarence Rogers, a minor, is a newborn Cherokee freedman, opposite role number 203, and that such Look Cherokee that. freedmen received from the Cherokee Nation allotment of land, a part which is described. There goes the legal land description. Then it says your petitioner would further show the court that the said ward is now 15 years of age. Notice they did not say that the person was dead. This is a living person that sometime about two and one half uh, or three months ago, while said ward was attending Western University in Kansas City, in Kansas, Kansas. Yes. a school for her race, said ward was taken sick and contracted what is pronounced at that time, pneumonia fever. This guardian brought her ward home and said ward has been and still remains in poor health and has developed what doctors now pronounce tuberculosis. Your petitioner will further show the court wow. that it is necessary to obtain medical aid, the advice, the advice and assistance of physicians to buy drugs and medicines. They wanted to sell part of this child's allotment so that they could take care of her medically. This was and what a, collection is that? This now? is in Craig County probate court record. Probate. And the person wasn't even And the dead. person was not dead. That's wild. Mm -hmm. Okay, one more example of something else that you can find inside of probate records. This is a drawing. Another drawing. What? Oh, I love that. Okay, of a house. I've never seen that. This, is my, this is my sixth, actually my seventh great grandfather drew this picture in 1773. Get out of here. And it was included in a chancery court case file that was on the Library of Virginia that where his daughter had gotten married and her siblings were saying that her father, that their father had been coaxed out of his land and his property because he was old and he didn't realize what he was doing. So as a way to prove that he knew what he was doing, he drew this picture of his house or of a house and wrote at the bottom his name and how old he was in 1773. He was 97 years old. Aww. Wow. He amazing. wasn't... He wasn't dead yet. Here yet still is another example <laughs> right, of not dead people in chancery court or probate court records. So don't assume that's every record good. is for somebody who's dead. Any final thoughts before we wrap up, guys? No, that's pretty good. Can't top that. <laughs> I think that I think that one thing that uh, we're showing today is that um, death and probate records can can be just as complicated as people's lives sometimes. You know, one thing that I didn't mention my uh, file earlier is one of the things I thought was interesting is that uh, William J. Ward had financial relationships with a man named Alexander C. Gordon, who was a slave owner of my three times great grandmother and her her family, her, her parents. So even though there wasn't a blood connection between the enslaved individuals, as far as we know, we do know there was a financial connection, which again, these people are living together and whatnot and interacting in different ways. So, you know, things, things can seem very direct at, at, at first, but when you look at the finer details, you can find a lot of things that broaden and, and add color to the picture which you're painting. Yeah. I agree. I agree. And uh, don't read through the whole thing. If you don't learn anything from us, read through the entire record, court record. Make sure that you check in um, the entire thing. You want to make sure that you read every line you don't that you could potentially miss something um i think a lot of folks on today actually mentioned that they went back through stuff that they had already found right. um and um you know just just by rereading it right mm -hmm. and and redistilling the information i think reese's you know the thing that she talked about really home that really drove that home is redistilling the information and not discounting what the elders say because I'll, I'll never forget my great aunt told me uncle andrew got hit by a train and i'm like lord she done made that up she went she, she done gone senile ain't no way andrew got hit by a train and then when i pulled the actual death certificate it said he was hit by a train body cut in half so she wasn't lying oh. so oh. Yeah. So, so wow. don't discount the elders, right? They got something to say. They got something to share. So, Hey, what are we doing for week six? Uh Oh, we're talking about the Freedmen Bureau. Yes. That one. Yes. We love the Freedmen's Bureau. That is going to be our next topic during week six. If you have not gotten familiar with it, I highly suggest that you head to the National Archives website and download the descriptive guide for your particular state to read how it was organized. If it fell under one state or the other at one particular point in time, what records are available, whether or not they've been digitized. Of course, we're going to provide you links to a number of different things, but 
you know, get prepped, get ready, right? This is the time we are hunkered down in the home and um, you have put off probably for a long time looking at Freedman's Bill records because they're not an easy win. <laughs> Notice everything we keep bringing up is not an easy win. <laughs> Anything worth having is easy what you said mm. so next week we're going to be into the freedmen's bureau i'm excited this is one of my favorite favorite record sets that i feel is completely underutilized also check out where the nearest field office was to your ancestral location by going to mapping the look at the map there's also links to the descriptive guides for different areas all over the country that's a product of our own auntie angela and tony carrier they put together <laughs> that website and uh, oh, Trisha Blount said the Freedman Records hazed her. It really did. It, the Freedman Records, I would say, is like a pledge process. It for real is. You better look, you better dig down deep in your soul and start calling the ancestors because sometimes, baby, <laughs> but they're so good once you actually do find something. Um, and so, yeah, Lord, oh my goodness, the con <laughs> stay up all night. That's when you find the good stuff. That's what Denise Muhammad said. And then Dante uh -huh. said, Dante Eubanks said, yes, ma'am. And then take a sick day from work. Cause you can't stop. I have to talk to my cousin Dante. Oh God! <laughs> Two of us can't be showing out, Dante. Come on, man. I know, I know, I know. Oh my goodness, that's so true. So yeah, you all, thank you so much for joining us again on this Friday. We know we talked about a bunch of different topics, um, but we hope that you stay up all night long looking at everything and that you make some super good genealogy finds. Of course, be sure to reach out to us, comment. I love when we hear from you guys. Um, be sure to comment on um this video if you're especially if you're watching the the um recording replay. yeah if you're watching the replay anything else you guys want to say before we head on out or are we good stay safe just stay safe yes yeah. yes stay your behind in the house yeah. <laughs> yep. I like to all right 